Good morning and welcome to Bread of Life, Deaf Lutheran Church. Today we begin a six week series studying the book of Job and practicing lament. Lament is a unique time when we are free to express our sorrow, our mourning, and our regrets. To do this, we use poems and songs, psalms, and prayers. We passionately cry out our lament, our sorrow, our grief, and those regrets we have. To do that, we make up our own poems and songs. We write our own psalms and our own prayers. don't need to feel like you have to do all of this today. We'll be practicing lament for six weeks. So we have time to learn how to do these things. And this morning, those of us leading worship, as you can see here, there are three of us. And I am Michelle Lewis. I'm the pastor at Bread of Life Deaf Lutheran Church. And I'm glad that you are here with us today. And hello, I am Deacon Dorothy Sparks. Hello, and my name is Wendy DeVore, and I will be interpreting today. We are glad that you are here. As we enter into worship, we confess with Job that we bring nothing into this world at our birth. And we take nothing with us at death. The Lord alone gives and takes away. And still, we praise the name of the Lord.
God, everything we have and everything we do not have belongs to you. We belong to you. God, from your life and your spirit, you breathe life into your creation. We have our life in you. Lord, we bless you. We bring nothing at birth. And we take nothing with us at death. The Lord alone gives and takes. And still, we praise the name of the Lord. God, sometimes we are like Job's friends. We are not helpful. We blame people for the tra tra tragedies and trauma. We do not take the time to sit and to contemplate another's experience. God, suffering is a mystery. It comes to some, but not to others. Please allow people who suffer to know you are near. Forgive us for our indifference to others' pain and suffering. Forgive us for racing to get over it, brushing past that very pain and suffering in our world. Help us to face suffering, not turn away or pretend that has not happened. Help us to question suffering and not to accept it and give up on being with others. Help us respect that in suffering, we experience what you experienced in the cross. May we draw near to you, O oh God. My friends, in the experience of the cross, Jesus enters into our suffering and enters into the world's suffering because God loves us. God in Jesus Christ is willing to do this. Enter into suffering. God chooses to love us even when we are not lovable. <clears throat> God chooses to love us even when we're focused on ourselves. God chooses to love us even when it causes God pain and suffering. This is how we know we are forgiven and held in God's hands. God chooses to live with us and to die with us. 
to my friends and family in Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. May this forgiveness allow you to be like God. How? That you choose to love others even when they are not lovable. That you choose to love others even when they are focused on themselves. That you choose to love others even when it causes you pain and suffering. This is how we are like God in the world. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. My friends, our prayer for the day, for our time of lament and study in Job uh, is a, a poem that comes from this book, Ordinary Blessings. The book was written by Pastor Meta, and she is a pastor at Bethlehem Lutheran Church. And um, Bethlehem is the church where I was ordained. And uh, Pastor Meta has talked about how it's hard for her to start writing or start doing something without first blessing that work that she's doing. And as we are practicing lament, it is important for us to feel empathy for others. because lament is hard work. It is hard to feel deeply the sorrow and the grief of the world. And so our prayer of the day for the next six weeks will be a blessing for empathy. To bless the work and the energy and the compassion and the feelings that we have when we are empathetic with others. So let us pray. The world is not lacking opinions simplified by hindsight, advice for the weary, or subscriptions to the standardized. But we are starving for love that resists these defenses. Love that can stand in the midst of suffering without getting too awkward or filling the silence with trite proverbs, wanting to earn its place by fixing what doesn't need fixing at all. If only the instinct was to abide before we explain and decide
listen for the spirit who guides us into showing up, who shows us how to feel on behalf of another, who urges our quiet bodies alongside the ones who are not broken, but lonely. The ones God already loves, always loves. Amen. And now a reading from the Bible, Job chapter 1, verses 1 through 22. Many years ago, a man named Job lived in the land of Uz. He was a truly good person who respected God and refused to do evil. Job had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 pairs of oxen, 500 donkeys, and a large number of servants. He was the richest pe person in the East. Job's sons took turns having feasts in their homes. And they always invited their sisters to join in the eating and drinking. After each feast, Job would send for his children and perform a ceremony as a way of asking God to forgive them of any wrongs that they might have done. He would get up early the next morning and offer a sacrifice for each of them, just in case they had sinned or silently cursed God. One day, when the angels had gathered around the Lord, and Satan was there with them, the Lord asked, Satan, where have you been? And Satan replied, I have been going all over the earth. Then the Lord asked, what do you think of my servant Job? No one on earth is like him. He is truly a good person who respects me and refuses to do evil. Why shouldn't he respect you, Satan remarked. You are like a wall protecting not only him, but his entire family and all his property. You make him successful in whatever he does. And his flocks and herds are everywhere. Try taking everything he owns and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord replied, all right, Satan, do what you want with anything that belongs to him, but do not harm Job. Then Satan left. Job's sons and daughters were having a feast in the home of his oldest son. When suddenly someone rushed up to Job and said, while your servants were plowing with your oxen and your donkeys were nearby eating grass, 
a gang of Sabians attacked and stole the oxen and donkeys. Your other servants were killed, and I was the only one who escaped to tell you. That servant was still speaking when a second one came running up and saying, God sent down a fire that killed your sheep and your servants. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Before that servant finished speaking, a third one raced up and said, three gangs of Chaledans attacked and stole your camels. All of your other servants were killed, and I am the only one who escaped to tell you. That servant was still speaking when a fourth one dashed up and said, your children were having a feast and drinking wine at the house of your oldest son, when suddenly a windstorm from the desert blew the house down, crushing all of your children. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. When Job heard this, he tore his clothes, and shaved his head because of his great sorrow. He knelt on the ground, then worshiped God and said, we bring nothing at birth. We take nothing with us at death. The Lord alone gives and takes. Praise the name of the Lord. In spite of everything, Job did not sin or accuse God of doing wrong. My friends, as we are in a worship time of lament, studying with the book of Job, uh, we will learn a new kind of prayer. It's a very old prayer, but it's new to us. It's a body prayer. And the woman who developed it, her name is Julian of Norwich. And she lived in the 1400s. And so this prayer has four prayer postures and we use our bodies to pray. And so uh, as we go through it, we'll go through the prayer four times. The first time we'll teach what our postures are. And then the second and third times we'll just go through the flow. And the fourth time I'll repeat the, um, the phrases that go along with each posture. So the first posture is one that's called a weight. And you notice it's a lot like how we sign weight. It's here. And what we're doing in this posture is we await God's presence, however it may come to us. The second posture is allow. Your hands go up a little bit. They can go all the way up. They can come here. You know, if your shoulders hurt, they don't, it's just the, the sense of looking to God. This posture, the goal is to allow yourself a sense of God's presence to come or not to come and to be what it is.
The third posture is accept. So your right hand goes to your heart, your left hand covers, and then you bow. And the idea here is that we accept as a gift whatever comes or what does not come. We are trying to accept that we do not know everything and that we are not in charge. The fourth posture is called attend. And it looks a little bit like serve. Is to pay attention. Right? So we attend to what we are called to do. Willing to be present. Willing to be God's love in the world. However God calls us to do that. So now we'll go through the prayer two times, just moving our bodies. I invite you to do the prayer with us. We await God's presence, however it may come. We allow a sense of God's presence to come or not to come. For God's presence to be what it is. We accept as a gift whatever comes and what does not come. We accept that we do not know everything. 
we accept that we are not in charge. Attend. We attend to what we are called to do. Willing to be present. Willing to love the world like God loves the world. We attend to what God calls us to do. While I was driving around, I noticed a lot of signs that were posted nearby in my neighborhood. And at that time, I didn't understand what this meant. Black Lives Matter. So I began doing some research. And I'd like to share with you some of the information that I found. There was a young Black teenager and he was walking home after purchasing an item at a store and a man had seen him with his hood up and he called the police and as he went after this young man and I'm not sure what happened but this man shot him and killed him and when the police arrived he told him I had to shoot him I had to defend myself so the police, they looked him over and saw that this man had no bruises on him or anything. And so they arrested him for killing this young black man. And after this incident had happened, the black community responded in grief. And there were three black women that created these posters called Black Lives Matter. And so they were encouraging everyone to remember this. I had read another article that explained that if a white man is running down the street, if they're out for a jog or even just walking down the street, they wave to everyone and people wave, wave back to them and they don't have to fear for their life. But if a black man is running down the street or out for a walk, they have to fear for their life. Now you might remember um, on the news where this one young black man was actually jogging through a neighborhood and these three white men chased him down and they shot him. So why did this, why did they do this? Why, why are, why is the white community afraid of black men? There was another incident of a young black man he was 12 years old and walking along on the sidewalk and he had a toy gun with him and the police pulled up on him and they shot him. Within two seconds when they pulled up on him. They were afraid of him and they shot him. And in America, we talk about freedom, and yet we have a long history of violence and oppression in this country. In 1863, President Abraham Lincoln decreed that slavery was no longer legal and that black people were freed from slavery. And even though they were freed from slavery, they still were not able to find employment and they were segregated in housing and they couldn't sit in the same restaurants or even ride the bus with people who were white. 
Black people were told they had to sit in the back of the bus until one day when Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat. Rosa Parks, who was a black woman, and that incident began the Civil Rights March. And it was a peaceful protest. And in spite of it being peaceful, this march of, of black community members frightened the white community and they arrested them and tried to stop them from protesting. And just recently, last week, John Lewis, who was a representative, had just passed away. And he had been involved in these marches. And I was surprised to hear that he had been arrested 45 times for these protests. And he still persisted and stood with the Black community. In 1964, President Johnson signed the civil rights saying that black people were equal with white people. And even though that this was signed into law, they did not experience the justice and the equality that white people experience. And so the white people in America showed that they did not value the life of a black person as their own or equal to their own. And so the stories of innocent black people being killed and murdered over and over again began to create frustration and depression among the black community for years and years and years until recently when George Floyd was killed by a white police officer, the years of oppression and violence that the black community had faced erupted like a volcano. And this eruption caused the white community to wake up. I had one person that actually came up to me and said, I'm glad that Minneapolis erupted because it finally brought this to my attention. And I think that more people are now realizing the oppression and the violence that the black community has experienced and understand the meaning that black lives matter. Now it doesn't mean that black lives matter more than white people's lives, but their point is to remind people that black lives matter and that the lives of black children matter, that we need to nourish and enhance their dreams for their own future as well. So these incidents are causing us to wake up and to realize how historically the Black community has experienced oppression and violence. Now, we might have thought in the past, well, Black lives, maybe they, it didn't really matter. You know, people are saying, oh, you have to be careful. And, and maybe we, or we just didn't recognize that people weren't valuing the lives of black people. So we need to break this cycle. We need to break this cycle and stop feeding into this system. And we need to realize and truly take seriously that Black lives do matter.
Now, some people have altered this to say all lives matter or women's lives matter or deaf lives matter. So I've seen a variation on this theme, but black people are saying that it still doesn't hold the same weight. So there was this one black woman who made this sign and I'd like to show you what it says. It says black lives matter And so she's saying, yes, Black Lives Matter. And we never said only Black Lives Matter. We're not saying that, that only Black Lives Matter and not anyone else's. We know all lives matter. but we need your help because black lives are in danger. So maybe we think, well, this isn't really that, that cr critical because our lives don't feel threatened. But we need to realize that black people and, and the black community feel that their lives are threatened. And if you're in fear of your life, that will cause depression and fear. So what can we do? How can we be a part of Black Lives Matter and show that their lives are valued as well. And in the Bible, it says love is stronger than fear. Fear causes division. Love creates unity. Fear creates hopelessness. Love creates and there are that creates dreams for the future and fear causes people to ignore what is happening and love causes us to pay attention and to be present about 4 years ago there was a, a deaf pastor from Nigeria And she came here to the United States uh, for a deaf Lutheran conference. And she was visiting several different deaf churches. And she was here for six weeks. And she told me that even though I have black skin, people here love me. And that shows that love conquers fear. She was amazed that she was accepted and loved here in America, even though her skin was black. Love is more powerful than anything else. And people are crying out for love and for peace and for justice. We as Christians need to take up responsibility and to share God's love. Now you might be asking yourself, well, how can I do this? How can I share God's love? You do this through an open mind and opening your hearts and to listen and to learn and pray and to offer support. Now I would like to sign a verse from the Bible and have you sign with me.
For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, prayer for others. In Jesus, we know that God longs to be involved in our lives. For God to know us. And for us to know God. We need to bring our whole selves to God. God, it is not fair that some people must endure horrible circumstances. We must tell you about the pain in our world. Right now, too many children do not have a home or country. They live in refugee camps or jails. Some are separated from their parents or their brothers and sisters and other family. Today, there are boys and girls stolen from their parents. They are slaves and they cannot get to safety. People are sick and now many people die alone. In the United States, this happens more often for people with black or brown or indigenous skin colors. We pray for teachers, students, administrators, and many others involved in planning for the school year. Give guidance and wisdom. With Job, we will not keep this to ourselves. Too many people and too much of your creation is suffering. We are frustrated and sad and overwhelmed. We must let you know our complaints and our concern. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. and also with you. Please take a couple of minutes here to share a sign of God's peace with others. It's, as we've talked about in other weeks, it's so important to check in with one another as we continue to be separated. We are not worshiping together in our building. So get out your phone and text someone or a quick type up an email. Let them know I'm thinking of you and share the peace that comes from God with you. And just as sharing the peace uh, from a distance is kind of weird, we continue to ask for your financial support, your prayer support, and your involvement in what we're doing here at Bread of Life, to ask for those things as a response to God's love. And even when we complain and cry out to God, God still loves us. Even when we tell God, Oh, we're so frustrated. We're so sad. We're so overwhelmed. God still loves us. 
And my friends, that is the message that we are invited to share with other people who are deaf with their families. God loves you at your best and at your very worst. God loves you. Opportunity for online worship. We are sharing that message with more people than we were before. We are sharing the message. God loves deaf people. And these worship videos are available always so you can easily send it to your friends and invite people to come to our Sunday morning Zoom coffee time and time for conversation. So we are doing the work. We're not going to our building, but we are doing the work God has called us to do. To tell this good news that God loves deaf people and their families and their friends. God loves you. So please prepare your offerings and send them to Bread of Life. And if you're interested to give online through PayPal, please let me know. You can um, type a message in uh, the chat window here on YouTube, or you can send me an email and let me know that you're interested to do that. Um, we're working on getting everything set up for PayPal. So thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for continuing to pray for bread of life. Thank you for continuing to show up and be present. And now the Lord's Prayer. My friends, let us pray together before we are sent out into the world. God, there is so much. Mm. Sometimes I feel totally overwhelmed and I long to just check out, to stop paying attention to your world to stop focusing on others. It feels like at every turn, there's some other thing I'm supposed to know. Ugh. In these moments, it is tempting to lose my curiosity, to lose momentum, to lose the one that I am in you. Please turn me back to you. Drive me to my knees in prayer. Catch me in your strong arms. Deepen my faith and trust in Jesus. Then I can be your presence for someone else who needs to know that you love them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My friends, 
as we come together in a service of lament, when we cry out and complain to God, it feels risky. Maybe we worry that God will be upset with us for complaining. So today, right now, receive this blessing, this promise that God loves you. God saves you. When the waters of life rise up to your neck and you feel like you're going to drown, when you are sinking in the mud, you feel so stuck, like you can't take another step. When the ground underneath you is moving and there is no firm place to stand, when the deep, deep waters swirl all around you. God saves you every time. And now maybe this week, you might feel like you're in this boat being tossed about in the storms of life. Remember, God jumps into the water and stays with us. God chooses to be in the waters with us. God loves me. God loves you, and God loves all. Now go, share the good news with one person this week that God loves you. Thanks be to God. <laughs>